partners meeting. So um, we're really pleased and happy. All right, uh, the topics of fine tuning argument, I don't think the, uh, the question is, is the uh, uh, universe finely tuned? The issue is, does the fine tuning point to God? So, all right, first of all, what is the fine tuning argument? Uh, the constants in laws of physics and initial conditions in the universe are extremely finely tuned to enable any form of life. Um, this is also called the Goldilocks uh, effect after the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. So Goldilocks went into the house and she tasted some porridge and the first porridge was too hot and then she tasted uh, the mother bear's porridge was too cold and then she tasted baby bear's porridge and it was just right. And the same goes for the chairs and there's Goldilocks feeling very happy because she's found a chair that is just right. So the Goldilocks effect that says that the universe is just right for supporting life and many believe that this points to an intelligent designer. It is a form of the design argument and the design argument is also called the teleological argument because the Greek word telos means goal. So it's saying that the universe has a goal or a purpose. Now, what does it actually mean that the universe is finely tuned? What are the implications? Uh, fine tuning doesn't just mean if the universe wasn't fine tuning, Earth would be barren. It doesn't just mean that. It means if it wasn't finely tuned, there would be no Earth. All right? Without the fine tuning, there would be no galaxy clusters, clusters of galaxies. There would be no galaxies. There would be no stars. There'd be no planets. You wouldn't be able to form elements of the atomic table. You wouldn't have, even have elements. You may only have a hydrogen or helium. Um, but you wouldn't be able to form um, the atomic table consisting of around about 100 or so elements. You wouldn't be able to form large molecules. So everything would be very simple and basic. There'd be no life, and of course, we wouldn't be here as well. So without fine-tuning, what would the universe be like? Well, Genesis 1 is suggestive. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Now Genesis 1 is obviously just referring to the earth, not to the universe as whole. But what it's actually saying there would actually be true of the universe as a whole. It would be empty, dark, and pointless, be formless. Now, uh, this is a, a fine-tuning argument, it's a design argument, okay? So I'd like to say what the limitations of the <coughs> argument are. It points to a designer, but not necessarily to a creator, right? So it's not an argument for a creator, just a designer. And the designer is not necessarily the Christian God. So this argument can be shared by other faiths such as Jews and Muslims. They're quite happy to use it, just as we are. So we're not actually uh, narrowing it down to the Christian God. It could even support deism as well, but it seems to be arguing against atheism. Um, just a bit of history on the design argument. Um, in 19, sorry, 1802, William Paley published uh, this book, Evidences of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity. And he used an analogy of the watch and a watchmaker. He said, imagine you found a watch in a field. Would you conclude that the watch was due to chance or design? He then argued that nature is like a watch. And so he provided many examples of design in nature, such as the human eye. And his work was highly influential. However, another man came along later and guess what his name was? No. <laughs> no, Charles Darwin. Um, in uh, 1859, he published On the Origin of Species. And many believe that this product would provide an explanation of how the appearance of design was due to chance. And so it undermined um, Paley's argument. And um, this seemed to be mainstream for a number of years, uh, until 1973. This was the 500th anniversary of Copernicus' birth, and there was a conference in Krakow, in Poland. Do I get the pronunciation yes. right? Yeah, okay. And um, a guy called Brandon Carter got up and uh, presented a paper, and it was on the fine-tuning of physics, and he introduced the idea 
of the anthropic principle, that the um, laws of physics seem to be so constructed uh, uh, and finely tuned, otherwise human life or any form of life would not be possible. And uh, this has kind of started a, a, a movement and a number of scientists and um, physicists especially um, did studies and investigations and um, came to the conclusion that there are a number of physical constants and initial conditions that are finely tuned to enable the universe to be life permitting. But how many are there? How many parameters? Well, a, a scientist called Martin Rees published a book and he called it just six numbers. So he identified six numbers which had to actually be finely tuned in order to the universe to be life permitting. However, others have come along and say, uh, say that conservatively there are at least 12 constants and 12 initial conditions. And some people have uh, come up with lists of up to around about 200. This is the formal version of the fine tuning argument. So it's in the form of what we call the syllogism. So it's got two premises and a conclusion. Um, the fine tuning of the constants and the laws of physics and the Big Bang initial conditions are due to law, chance, or design. The fine tuning is not due to law or chance, therefore, it is due to design. Um, and um, when people argue for it in that form, then they kind of argue for the two premises and then the conclusion must follow. But I won't go down the formal path, I think it's kind of fairly obvious anyway. Um, this is an example of fine tuning. Uh, if you just consider um, an atom or an element in the atomic table, um, a proton, sorry, a um, hydrogen atom just consists of a single proton. So that's not complicated, but as soon as you come along to helium, you have two protons and two neutrons. And apparently protons are red in colour and neutrons are blue in colour. No, not really. And then it's surrounded by a couple of electrons. It's a yellow. Yeah. 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 Um, but the protons repel each other due to electrostatic repulsion. And so the question is, why doesn't the nucleus blow itself apart? Well, there's another force that counteracts it called the strong nuclear force. And if you try to understand the strong nuclear force, just think of superglue. It has no action at a distance, but as soon as uh, hadrons come close together and come in contact, they stick. The interesting thing about the uh, strong nuclear force and the um, repulsion electrostatic uh, force is that they are finely balanced against each other. Um, if uh, the nu strong nuclear force was 2% weaker, the, you get no nuclei. You'd only have hydrogen atom atoms because they'd all blow apart due to the repulsion. If they were slightly stronger, you'd have no hydrogen at all. And as a matter of fact, you'd probably have all helium. You certainly wouldn't have the development of a hundred or so elements in the atomic table. So these are critically tuned together so that you can actually form elements um, or atoms uh, in the atomic table. Without that atomic table, the, the universe would be somewhat limited. Like there would be no galaxies, no stars. Uh, no life, no planets. Um, and of course there's no Darwinian explanation for this. All right? um, when we talk about this argument, it's important to mention probabilities, just to get a, a, quantify, a quantitative feel of what's going on. In order to consider uh, these numbers, we use powers of 10. Uh, so a minute, is one followed by six zeros, so it's 10 to the six. Most of you should know this, but um, not everybody does. There's less than 10 billion people in the world, so that's 10 to the 10. So 10 to the 10 is a very big number. The universe is claimed to be 10 to the 17 seconds old. That's 13 billion years, all right? So 10 to the 17 is an enormous number, all right? There are 10 to the 80 atoms in the known universe. So that's an unbelievably large number. Now opponents of the fine tuning argument rarely mention the numbers. Because as soon as you do, it kind of gives the game away. So the opponents generally have qualitative arguments rather than quantitative arguments. 
Now we'll have a look at the degree of fine tuning of some of the constants. The ratio between uh, uh, EMF, electromagnetic force, and gravity, if you actually change that by 1 in 10 to the 37, uh, you would not have a life emitting universe, one way or the other. Um, if uh, the gravity was slightly stronger, the universe would collapse in itself. And uh, if it was slightly weaker, it would blow apart. The expansion rate of the universe is finally tuned to 1 in 10 to 55. Alright? The mass density of the universe is uh, tuned to within 1 to 10 to the 59. The cosmological constant um, is a, a parameter that appears in Einstein's equation on relativity, general relativity. That has to be tuned between 1 and 10 to the 120th power. Alright, and remember there's only 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe, so that is an unbelievably enormous number. And then uh, the initial entropy in the universe apparently is tuned in 1 to the 10 to the 10 to 123. Right, this is called the Penrose number. So that is 1 followed by 10 to the 123rd zeros. Okay? It's an unbelievably large number. So I'll just talk on this last one. This is called the Penrose number after Roger Penrose. Roger Penrose is one of the leading cosmologists in the world. He's, um, he and Stephen Hawking uh, developed the singularity theorems for the Big Bang. And um, he was the one who came up with this number. He says, this now tells us how precise the Creator's aim must have been. Namely, to an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power. This is an extraordinary figure. One could not possibly even write the number down. It would be one followed by 10 to the 123rd zeros. Right. So there's more zeros in this number than there are atoms in the universe. So the degree of fine tuning is unbelievably enormous. This is a picture of Fred Hoyle. He is a famous physicist because he developed the theory of nucleosynthesis in stars. So uh, the theory is that um, in stars you have hydrogen change into helium. So the elements of the atomic table are hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, boron, carbon. And he developed the theory of how carbon was actually formed in stars. And what he found out, there was uh, unstable conditions that seemed impossible that carbon could be um, developed in stars. And he postulated the existence of this very finely tuned resonance condition that allowed the generation of carbon in stars. And he was an atheist before this, and it really rocked him. And he moved across from being an atheist to a believer in intelligence design. Never became a Christian. He hated the Catholic Church. But he had to th reject his atheism. And this is what he said. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics, as well as with chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to be, to, to me, so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Now, atheists don't take the fine tuning argument lying down, and so there's a whole pile of objections to the fine tuning argument. Um, I've listed some on the next two slides, um, and I, but most of them I haven't got time to deal with them. You can ask questions during the break if you like. Um, the first one uh, there is the fine tuning is actually evidence against the existence of God. Strange but true. It's called the I. Peter Jeffries argument. Then other people say, oh, the universe is not actually finely tuned. Notice that these two arguments contradict each other. Um, our particular universe is not fine-tuned to us, we are fine-tuned to it, that's what we understand. Um, so, uh, the next one is, any possible universe is improbable, so we shouldn't be surprised that the one that we're in is improbable. Um, another person has said, the probabilities are not normalisable, I can explain that later if you want to know. Um, another one said it would be more impressive if God created life out of a universe that was not finely tuned. That would be a neat trick. Alright? Um, 
This is the only universe we know. We cannot know what would happen in other universes, so it's impossible to speculate. Um, and people, some people claim that the um, fine-tuning argument is just God of the gaps. We can't explain it, therefore God did it. Um, this is our next one, really common one. Uh, we don't know, but one day we'll find out. Right? Trouble with that, you can say that to anything. Because you can use that to explain anything, it explains nothing. Um, most of the universe, I reckon this next one is, uh, sounds a little bit a little better than the others. Most of the universe is actually hostile to life. Um, so God, you could have done better. All right? If most of the universe is hostile, couldn't God have made the whole universe more life permitting? Um, the next one is uh, Richard Dawkins' argument. God is no explanation. Um, if God designed the universe, then God must be more complicated than the universe, and so how do you actually explain God? Alright? Other people have suggested that a universe was designed by aliens. And uh, even Richard Dawkins says, I'd rather believe that aliens designed this universe than believe in God. Okay? Um, and the last one, the last two, uh, we should not be surprised the universe is finally churned, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And then the, the final one is a really serious one, that's the multiverse theory. So what argument? Um, we should not be surprised that the universe is finally churned, otherwise we would not be here to observe it. Now, um, that's actually a true statement. However, um, should we be surprised overall? I believe the answer is yes. So if you actually analyse this uh, statement with Bayes' theorem and consider conditional uh, probabilities, it's quite easy to see that it's a fallacy. But instead of going through the maths, I'll use um, so many people, have, uh, or some people have uh, proposed this firing squad analogy. It's probably a bit, sorry? What's happening in Bali at the moment? Yes, there's a little tape of stuff, isn't there? I'm sorry about that. Um, but imagine that you are condemned to death by firing squad. And so you have all these marksmen aiming at your heart. And somebody says, ready, aim, fire. And you hear all the gunshots go off. But behold, you're still standing there. So what should you say? She say, oh, gee, that's surprising. Or should you say, I'm not surprised that they all missed, otherwise I would not be here standing. Okay, so you can see the fallacy of the argument. We should be surprised overall that we're here. The, the last argument is the multiverse theory. Uh, all the others don't have strong support, all right? But this one does have substantial support, all right? What the, this argument says, that there could be a huge number of other universes that we cannot see. Most of these would have different physical laws and most of them would be not life permitting. They'd just be barren and void. There'd be nobody there to observe it. But if you roll the dice that many times and you come up with different combinations, then maybe one time you get lucky. And so everything fits in place. And uh, so we have to live in a lucky one. We couldn't live in anything other than a lucky one. And so... Um, when you say this has got a lot of support, what do you mean? What, what sort of support does it have? Lots of people support it? Well, it's commonly argued, argued by atheists, and uh, there's a lot of uh, scientific research into the potential for multiple universes. And it um, fall, falls out of string theory, which is something that they can't validate anyway. Yeah, right. uh, so, uh, 100 years ago, people never considered this seriously, all right? It was the domain of science fiction stories, H.G. Wells and things like that, but now it's considered seriously. And it's only been considered seriously after the fine tuning became illegal. All right, so to the degree that uh, atheists now accept it as an uncontroversial fact. Um, now, uh, these are objections to the multiverse explanation. First of all, it is highly speculative. 
Uh, it talks about universes that we can't see, so it's untestable. Um, and um, so it's outside the, do the domain of empirical science. And uh, so there are um, quite a substantial body of um, uh, physicists who just say it's non science because it can't be tested. Uh, even Richard Dawkins admits that this is a very extravagant way to find, uh, explain the fine tuning. There's a, another a problem called the Boltzmann brain problem. So the Boltzmann brain is basically a brain in the back where all the sensations are actually fitting. So uh, you think you're seeing a reality, but it's all simulated. So you're the only brain around, and this is all the simulation. Um, but they've argued that that is far more likely than what we observe in this physical universe. And the other problem is, if there is this multiverse generator, it ends up that the multiverse generator has to be is, has to be finely tuned, so that requires an explanation as well. So the current state of play is this. Either you believe that the universe was designed by a uh, designer, <coughs> or there are an infinite number of universes with random physical laws, and we happen to live in the lucky one. So judge for yourself which is more plausible. Um, just, I haven't gone through much detail in the objections, um, so I'll just make these uh, general observations. I've read heaps of them, and really most of them are ridiculous. They contradict each other, and uh, a lot of them immediately go into extreme complication, confusion, obfuscation. And um, so the temptation is when you actually read them, say, gee, this is complicated, I don't understand it. This guy must be brilliant, so he must be right. But I don't think that's the nature of the case at all. Um, it's really an attempt to battle people, battle people, baffle people with the S. That's an acronym for something, I can't remember what it was. Um, anyway, it says more about people's motives than prior assumptions, rather than being serious arguments. Um, I attended the Global Atheist Convention in 2012 in Melbourne and one of the speakers was Lawrence Krauss and he uh, gave an overview of his book A Universe from Nothing and uh, I actually met him briefly and he signed, I bought a copy of his book and he signed it. Uh, but during his talk he admitted, I just don't like the idea of God. And you kind of wonder how deep that motivator is to him. And I think that's a, a, a lot of what is behind it. This is an admission by Richard Lewontin. He's a top biologist. And this is an interesting quote. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. And by materialism he means the belief that the material world is all there is. So it's a denial of the supernatural, okay? not being materialistic and wanting heaps of goods. He goes on. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept the material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary that we are forced by our a priori adherence. A priori is Latin and it means without evidence, okay? Um, adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. No matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, moreover that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Okay? You see where he's going? Richard Dawkins refers to the illusion of design. We look at this and that looks designed, but we should actually apply the duck test to this. So if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, waddles like a duck and quacks like a duck, then perhaps it is a duck. Um, this uh, person is Paul Davies. 
And um, he's not a Christian by any means, but um, he's been convinced by the fine-tuned argument that really God exists. He says, there is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. He uh, says also, I cannot believe that our existence in this universe is a mere quirk of fate, an accident of history, an incidental blip in the great cosmic drama. Our involvement is too intimate. We are truly meant to be here. Uh, this is a quote from um, Aristotle. Aristotle uh, lived 350 years before Christ. He knew nothing about Christianity, of course. He probably knew very little about uh, the Jews. But he gives this um, kind of parable. He says, imagine a race of men who lived underground and never beheld the sky. When thus they would suddenly gain sight of the earth, the seas and the sky, when they should come to know the grandeur of the clouds and the might of the winds, when they should behold the sun and should learn its beauty and grandeur as well as its power to cause the day by shedding light over the sky. And again, when the night had darkened the lands and they should behold the whole of the sky spangled and adorned with stars. And when they should see the changing lights of the moon as it waxes and wanes and the risings and settings of all these celestial bodies, their course is fixed and changeless throughout all eternity. When they should behold all these things, most certainly, they would have judged both that there exist gods and that all these marvellous works are the handiwork of the gods. He was living in polytheistic time, of course. But you can't, well, just um, what he's actually saying, well, I think it's what he's saying is um, when we're living above ground for so many years, we get used to what we see and we start to take it for granted. But if we could see it all fresh, we'd be blown out by socks. And the impression of design would be for us overwhelming. So the Apostle Paul puts it this way. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, you'll recognise some of my arguments in the uh, brief summary of the Kevin's given you that I have to say that most of the arguments that Kevin rejected as ridiculous, I think are also ridiculous. This has been an area where a lot of uh, distinguished scientists have not come to themselves with glory. Um, now, for some, I accept that cosmology has shown that various physical parameters and values uh, that determine the nature of the physical universe to make it the universe it is, are such, and they differ even microscopically from their actual values, the universe would have been vastly different, no galaxies, no complex atoms, and of course, therefore, no life, no humans. Uh, so, in that sense, fine-tuning is a fact. The parameters are so close to what has to be for the present universe that it's eerie. Um, and that is to the basis of the argument for a designer. Um, because that is the result of chance, seems so incredibly improbable. It's right. Now, I want to argue, admitting the first premise to fine tuning of the universe, that it doesn't make probable uh, uh, or plausible the existence of an intelligent designer, let alone uh, a traditional uh, kind of god. Um, just on the argument from design, uh, as Kevin points out, in the 18th century, people like Paley argued from the uh, analogy between organisms, bodies, and watches. They were so intricate, and in particular, the parts seemed to be put together for a purpose, the good of the organism, so the bits of the eye had to all function together to produce uh, clarity and vision. Um, and so, by analogy, watches need designers, watchmakers, so the universe needs a designer, 
a divine watch maker vast and more intelligent. Now, that's the sort of position that Darwinian evolution undercuts. Doesn't show, God, Darwin doesn't show there couldn't be a God. It just shows that there could be naturalistic explanations of those sort of phenomena, biological phenomena. But of course, um, um, and most Christians, I think, have no trouble accepting the theory of evolution today. But evolution within the species, yeah, within yeah. species. Uh, <laughs> some do, some don't. <laughs> yeah. um, but evolution presupposes a universe that's already fine-tuned in all these complicated ways that there are, in particular, uh, carbon atoms and uh, uh, a benign environment on this planet. Uh, in other words, the evolution can't answer the deeper question, why is the universe such that evolution could have taken place? And that's where we need to look deeper. What's the explanation of the fact that these constants and these laws are as we observe them to be? When they could apparently be so easily different and even a slightly different, unrecognisable world. Um, now, I, the argument is the best explanation, in fact, some people say the only possible explanation for this fact is that the world was designed by an intelligent creature. Um, so, uh, an argument for the best explanation for what's observed, I guess all theory always go over for that, and it's a probabilistic argument. Um, you mentioned that uh, Fred Hoyle seems to have been converted to some sort of theism by this. Uh, famous atheist philosopher Anthony Flew it was also converted by this sort of argument. So it's powerful. I think it's the, uh, probably the best in the armory of the believer um, these days. Now, what's to be explained? Some, uh, well, typically, not just life, but uh, intelligent life, including us humans, and we're the most intelligent life that we know of. In the universe. So that actually means that this argument makes us central to the whole purpose of the universe, which takes us back to what we thought before a Copernicus, before the uh, astronomical revolution. Uh, and why in terms of life is significant is that it's easier to see intelligent life and sentient life, conscious life, as a good thing which a benevolent designer would want to bring about. Now, uh, this is only one of the reasons, the fine tuning argument is only one of the arguments for consideration of bad for belief in a, some sort of designer. And there's no reason why, if you've got other arguments, you shouldn't use them in conjunction with the argument. So, Now, as an argument for a Christian God, that's a sort of transcendent being, um, the argument is going to have two stages. It's going to be an argument for an intelligent desire, and then there'll have to be quite a separate argument. Sorry, <laughs> reason. I want to deliver it. Quite a separate argument. <laughs> This is not a chance. Give him five minutes or more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Argument one, which I think is the fine tuning argument, the argument from the intelligent designer. And the second, uh, there'll be arguments which identify the designer with the traditional Christian God. Two stages. So I think there's problems with both stages. Uh, my main focus is on obviously the first stage, but I'll say something to you. Now, a fine tuning argument. What sort of argument is it? As I say, it's, it's an explanation. Is it a scientific hypothesis or some other sort of hypothesis or some other sort of explanation? The point about hypothesis in science, and I think it goes for 
technical agents across the board, not just scientific ones. A good hypothesis won't just explain what uh, uh, has already been observed, but will go beyond it. Go beyond that to predict fresh observations. Something we didn't know, and hopefully this, these, these predictions are verified, confirmed, and which couldn't have been expected on any other or right hypothesis. So it makes uh, predictions which advance knowledge. Well, by that test, fine-tuning arguments are not good scientific arguments because they don't allow us to add to our knowledge of the universe. Makes no new predictions. As far as I can see, it's also not testable, and that makes it not even a scientific hypothesis of any sort. Not testable, that is the thesis of the fine tuning as a result of design, is advanced as um, more probable than the alternative which is chance. Uh, but we can't move beyond where we start. We stay there. Um, so I conclude it's not really a scientific hypothesis. Um, now, not all, not all explanations are scientific. I'm not, a, I'm not into scientism. But um, it may, so it may still be a good explanation of some other sort. But if so, the defendant needs to say what other sort and what other criteria for a successful explanation of that sort. Now I think, um, I'm, as I say, standard scientific uh, uh, objections are not very good at all. Stenger really does uh, excel in bad arguments. Uh, for instance, um, he says, look, here, yeah, the conditions for carbon-based life life are very finely tuned, uh, but perhaps there are other sorts of life. Perhaps there are, but a fine tuning argument is that no sort of conceivable life would be possible in the universe which was say a few seconds had a few milliseconds duration and consisted just height to the field. So no no uh, valid argument there. I don't accept the multiverse uh, argument at all either. It's totally speculative. It's untestable. It's unscientific. Uh, there are some, uh, apparently some theoretical uh, considerations behind it, which I don't understand. But uh, like most people, it's ontologically so entrapping that I think it's just crazy, wild at this stage. Okay, a few philosophical. Now we move on to philosophical objections, not scientific objections, as in the science is quite solid about the um, degree of fine tuning it is. Um, now, the only move from the fact that has the, a number of these parameters differed even slightly, the uh, uh, any kind of life would have been impossible because the universe would have been radically different. And it moves from that to the conclusion that the probability that they would have taken those values in the absence of a designer is utterly remote. That's the step that a lot of it's a probability challenge. I'm not one of them, so I'm um, just draw on an argument from um, David Hume here. Um, Hume was a critic of the design argument long before Darwin. Um, he points out that, uh, well, I don't think it's controversial this part of his uh, position, though it does assume a general imperative to philosophy, which is controversial. Um, we can only discover what are the causes of things empirically by observation and experiment. We have to look and see and test and so on. And we can roughly, we can conclude that A type things tend to cause B type things when we observe a number of instances when A's follow B's. 
uh, and we can establish a constant conjunction. But we only preserve one universe, uh, there is probably only one universe, and so we're in no position to draw any conclusions about, empirically, about the sort of things that might have caused it or caused it to be the sort of universe it is, empirically. It's true that we can reason from causes uh, to effects in single cases where we've got experience of similar, similar uh, uh, situations uh, and where we can draw our background knowledge of the laws of nature when we know the laws. But we have no experience and no knowledge of anything similar with respect to the universe. Um, so that makes the case quite different to any other empirical one. We, uh, 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 here we're trying to explain why the laws and the constants that we observe are as they are. Um, the probability judgments are usually made, ordinarily made, in the context, context of background knowledge, which includes knowledge of initial conditions and laws. So, so the question whether we can <coughs> talk of the probability, probability in the context of the nature of the universe. So that seems a uh, Okay, just now let's move on. Purpose, talk about purpose for the purpose of the universe, purpose of the fine In the strict sense, purposes are conscious intentions. You need a, uh, an intelligent agent or an agent of some sort who have goals. And I think it's hard to conceive purposes without consciousness, though some want to have a, uh, a weaker form of a designer who is not conscious. That won't serve the purpose of the theist, but it would make trouble for the atheist and the material. So, how do we tell when something is made for a purpose? Now, if you already have reason to believe that God speaks to us through the Bible, no problem with what the purpose of the universe is. It's, it's, uh, it's a sin. But if we've only got the thing to go by, if we're just looking at the thing, trying to deduce whether it has a purpose and what that purpose is, then uh, in order to show that it was made for a particular purpose, it's not sufficient to show that it results in a particular outcome. I have a particular outcome, which is the purpose it exists for. Um, for example, guns are designed. When a pistol is fired, it makes a sound. But that's not the purpose of the gun. That's a side effect. Nothing to do with its purpose. Um, so that anything has a certain effect by itself, by itself, doesn't show that it was made to achieve that purpose. May have been, but it may have not been, and maybe not made for that purpose, maybe not made at all. So if the laws and constants should be different, then not any life, yep, but intelligent life would have been impossible. But so with many other things. So with many other things, between the whole universe and the earth. So why about life? Why focus on life? The answer, I think, to that, I think to that is because we are living, uh, we are intelligent of life, we naturally value and think we're pretty good. Um, uh, now, Unless you make assumptions about the preferences of the intelligent designer, you cannot predict anything about the kind of universe it would make or design. You need to put preferences in. Because intelligence itself is neutral. It can be used for any purpose, good or malign. Um, a malevolent designer, uh, uh, you can argue that the universe seems beautifully fine-tuned to make pain and suffering possible. 
And the evidence of this is all those uh, amazing um, uh, formulae uh, that had been vivid even by 10 or 120 years. Pain and suffering would have been impossible. So the fine tuning argument is equally an argument for the thesis that the fine tuning is for the purpose of pain and suffering and that the designer was malevolent. Um, and you can think of other things that exist and you can make them the purpose of the universe should you want. The question then is, um, um, is there a principled way of deciding which of these purposes is the one that explains in fact the universe that we observe and the fine tuning of the universe? Observation of the world itself won't settle that question. In fact, my answer is it's entirely subjective matter. What we care about, that's not much to know. Um, and I will uh, go on to mention briefly one of the uh, arguments that Kevin mentioned that is, that the universe isn't particularly well fashioned to uh, sustain life, since most of it is intensely hostile to life. Um, vast stretches seem completely lifeless, and we couldn't imagine any kind of life in them. SETI hasn't uncovered um, signals yet, that's okay. Um, um, they've been at it for 40 years, 50 years. Um, so it is possible, in fact, that life on Earth is unique in the universe. Possible, we just don't know, but that's a possibility. I wouldn't be prepared to put into a probability to this. Um, so, the question is, if the universe was made by a designer who values life, why is there so little of it? And uh, 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 in the big picture, life seems so insignificant as a, as a feature of the universe. Beyond that, we know that one day the sun will expand and destroy life on Earth. Not, not, not in our lifetime, several billion years from that. Then, possibly, there will be no life anywhere in the universe. That's a possibility, a lifeless universe. So much for fine tuning. So, if we infer, infer the attributes of designer from the um, attributes of the design, of the product, then um, the hypothesis of an all powerful, all good God is not the most plausible. Um, um, if we have to, of course I won't mention problems of evil there, but um, that's also an issue reducing the nature of design and the purpose of design. So if the task is to deduce the designer's nature from the design, we have to infer either um, an imperfect designer, not uh, in complete command, or one to whom the flourishing of life was a very high priority. As uh, many have pointed out, there's no need to postulate a single designer, perhaps there were more than one, uh, perhaps the uh, divine watchmaker set the world in motion like a mechanism of lost interest in it. As you mentioned, that's the deistic hypothesis. It fits um, uh, the picture. So, the, clearly the God of the monotheistic religions is only one of many design hypotheses which uh, uh, fit the observation. But, no, it was, uh, in our experience, that is, empirically, intelligent designers are always physically embodied. Conscious agents who work, of course, with pre existing materials in a more governed world. I have to understand that more of the word with it. Intelligence and consciousness in our experience are dependent on possessing a functioning brain, a properly functioning brain, a damaged brain and a disaster. 
In fact, lots of philosophers today argue that mental states are reducible to state, physical states of the brain. Obviously, theologians and Christians won't accept that kind of materialism. So it is pretty much the dominant view in philosophy of mind and cognitive science today, incidentally. Um, okay, so uh, Christians will postulate a purely spiritual intelligence as the designer. Um, and they're entitled to, uh, we can't beg materialism, isn't entitled, isn't entitled to beg the question against the opponent here. Okay, but in proposing a purely spiritual intelligence, uh, uh, they nece they're necessarily leaving behind the scientific picture, the picture of how we uh, uh, make deductions from what we observe, and postulate a being and a mode of operation utterly different from the world of our experience. Maybe defensible metaphysics. I don't want to prejudge that I'm going to say. But in the context of plausibility and the probability of explanatory hypotheses, it seems to me to greatly reduce the plausibility of the hypothesis that the uh, universe is the product of such an immaterial being. Okay, final, final objection. Again, it's one that uh, um, is uh, very well known. Um, you want to explain the fine tuning of the universe by postulating the designer, you need to explain the fine tuning of the designer. Now, um, in other words, the complexity in, uh, uh, in the order in the mind of God. As David Hume said, a mental world or universe of ideas requires a cause as much as does a material world or universe of objects. As I've said, designers now experience need brains. So, designer of the world, well, let's concede that God as a spiritual, as a spiritual being doesn't necessarily have a need of brain to perform his uh, uh, intelligent design. It must still be true that his mind must contain a huge number of representations, that is, ideas, conceptions. Uh, there will be representations of the world that he wants to create, representations of all the possible laws, to the powers of the home and whatever, uh, and the implications of each of these for the possibility of life. Back to the traditional God is supposed to have a direct knowledge of every state of the world, past, present, and future. So the complexity of God's mental life must be at least as great as the complexity in order of the observed universe. So, okay, the plan in the mind of God. As explained, fine tuning of the universe, obviously, what is the explanation of that plan? And the fact that there exists a being with the desire and the capacity to, to uh, create such a plan uh, and to implement it. That's uh, the design that can't design itself or themselves. Uh, its will has to be efficacious before it can design innocent or will be. So it does seem to me that uh, uh, the defenders of, of the design argument in general, not just the fine tuning argument, have postulated a further entity to explain this absolutely surprising fact of fine tuning and uh, merely postponed the task of explaining the existence of fine tuning. Still there. But at this point, and this will have to be pretty much my last one, the standard view is to move away from empirical arguments to metaphysics and move into the uh, idea that God's a necessary being, unlike the universe and the contents of the universe, um, a being that couldn't have failed to exist, and as a necessary being, is self-explanatory. So, 
no need to find an explanation outside the world. Um, and what that does is to shift the argument to the territory, I think, of the cosmological argument, another argument, which I'm not going to discuss, but that's the argument. In fact, the existence of contingent being, being which might not be distant, and therefore need an explanation outside of themselves, uh, can only be explained by postulating the necessary being, the explanation of human distances within itself. Um, now, that's not the purpose of tonight's paper. I just wanted to point out that that's going to be a necessary step if you want to postulate any kind of transcendental God who escapes explanatory regress. Um, the more we learn about the universe, the more wonderful and surprising it seems. That's absolutely right. It cries out for explanation, no doubt about it. And I don't claim to have the slightest understanding of why they function to the way they are. But on any account, either we've got to postulate an infinite regress of causes and explanations, or we have to stop somewhere. We have to accept something as a brute fact, a basic phenomenon, which is incapable or has no further explanation. Uh, and we have to accept our ignorance. I don't think we gain any better understanding of that universe that uh, what we find so amazing by postulating a radically different being as its uh, explanation. Thank you. I think most of the people here are regular attendants, so they know the format of these. Uh, my wife is sitting at the back there, she's. Oh. <laughs> you going to come and join us? Yeah, you do. Just keep going. Yeah. You can. <laughs> so everybody knows the format. It's a Q and A type thing, so you can address your question to um, one or, one or other of the presenters tonight. Um, and I think we should give the other person the right to add to it if they wish. Um, so it's a, it's a choice of that. So so. You, there might be a particular thing. Um, sometimes we may offer a comment to the, to the wider audience, and that's, that's okay as a, as a point of discussion, but um, if we could restrict our comments um, down and just make more specific questions, it would be good. I'll, I'll do a Tony Jones, and uh, so that's a comment. Um, so without further ado, if somebody's got an open question, that would be good, yeah. So just sort of a comment on a question. Um, one of the uh, arguments we had about um, the, the value of the fine tuning argument is that in the universe we're on one tiny little bit, but maybe that's all there is, so therefore God's not that much interested in, in life. Um, so, just as an analogy, in Europe on the border of Switzerland, there's the uh, thing called the Large Hadron Collider, which is just being refurbished and about to start again, looking for the things that are a bit bigger than I think goes on, which is turned around. And if you look at that, I think it's 17 kilometres around, and all the particles around, 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 and then the impact on one little spot in the middle, um, which is centimetres across, I think. Um, if you were looking at that with the same argument, you'd say that the scientists who designed the Large Hadron Collider aren't much interested in the collisions that go on, because there's only a tiny little bit of this great enormous thing that's actually where the collisions happen. So, an analogy, and I'm not sure how good a one, but uh, it may be that the only way you can have a little bit of space for life, like our tiny little planet here, is to have all the other stuff existing. Mm -hmm. And so just because we're on the scale of things that small, it's not necessarily an argument we're unimportant. That's the argument if you're going to uh, make an apple pie, you have to make a universe to start with. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the case, yeah. <laughs> well, certainly, if you uh, to design a uh, an atom smasher, you have to have a big machine to concentrate um, all that energy into a spot. So the design requires a lot of magnets around miles of perimeter. The point of which is um, that bit in the middle of the experiment you can do with it. We know that of the Hadron Collider. It was, we know why it was designed that way. All we know about the universe is that 
the only life of which we're aware is in one spot. We don't know whether it was designed um, with lots of empty space because that was the only way you could get it here or not. Yeah. So it's not a good analogy for life in the universe. But, um, that's, um, uh, Ian's argument's not his own. <laughs> well, I presume you didn't just think of it, did you? Because no, no, I've no, thought of it before now, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but because uh, um, uh, this point's been made by uh, many other people yeah. that um, you actually need uh, third generation stars uh, in order to actually generate or um, uh, uh, mm. heavy, elements or heavy elements, all that sort of thing. Uh, and so, uh, like the universe has to be so many billion years old. I know some people don't like this theory, but this is what some people uh, argue. It has to be uh, 10 billion years old in order to um, generate the elements necessary for life. And so it has to be that big as well, 10 billion light years across or whatever. So uh, basically it is, I think the uh, Large Hadron Collider um, analogy, I think is, it does have some point. Uh, but like, um, I think you made a point that other people have made, like if you kind of look at the ultimate destiny of the universe, like uh, Earth's going to get engulfed by the sun and um, then the um, universe will just kind of peter out in a whimper over many billions of years and you, you think, oh, what's the point? A <laughs> 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 large hadron collider has a planned lifetime. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that used to worry the Victorians, the heat death of the universe, mm -hmm. even though it was something unimaginably distant. Mm -hmm. It doesn't worry me, and it shouldn't be held against the design of that uh, thing that he creates is finite. Um, as long as there's lots and lots of uh, lives that are spent in it pleasantly and well. Which in fact is the case. Well, on Earth, that's not the case. Mm. Lots of other lives that go to it. Well, that's right. I mean, you mentioned the problem with evil. I guess we all of us recognise that. Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't think we doubt there is evil. We don't dispute it. You know, we, of course, say that it's man rebelling against his creator. And that's the reason we see evil. That's as plain as stated in Genesis chapter 3, so we don't have any fault with that argument. Mm. Yeah, you made the point that uh, the God hypothesis is not a scientific hypothesis. I think uh, we would agree. No. Uh, so we're actually using um, uh, scientific information to actually form a philosophical conclusion, which you can, like you can't directly test God. You can't test the conclusion, but you can. Uh, but uh, like, um, but and you also said. Like science is not the only source of knowledge, so we also have history, and uh, we might collect data in now to make inferences about the past, but we can't test the past. But history still has data, so I think we'd agree that it isn't, is it, it isn't a scientific hypothesis, but that doesn't mean that the conclusions are meaningless. Well, it is still the case that, uh, as far as I can see, it's a hypothesis that gives us no fresh insights into the universe. Uh, in, uh, the predictability. It predict, doesn't predict anything new, and that's not only a requirement for science, I would have thought. Um, more generally, a good explanation helps us better, get a better grasp, and perhaps a practical grasp by it. Uh, teaches us how to manipulate situations. Actually, in the case of Fred Hoyle, he did predict on the base, basis of the Earthraphic Principle. He said um, that basically uh, we're here and therefore there must be some explanation of how the carbon can uh, be generated. And so he postulated the resonance and then uh, pred predicted it. And then later on they tested it and found it was true. Yes, but that could have been predicted on uh, simply the hypothesis that we're yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I ask John a question? Um, I, I, think, I think I hear at the end your, the conclusion you were making after the, uh, the discussion was that we actually don't know and that maybe um, 
I, I didn't hear you say that you were an atheist, but maybe an agnostic. Is that no. that be a fair assumption or no? no I call myself an atheist. I don't think there's a god, um, but I don't know uh, why the constants are as they are, and I really despair about finding out. But I'm not a scientist. Um, I just don't see that you can plausibly move from our ignorance of this to uh, um, postulating, well, as I say, any kind of design, and certainly not traditional Christian uh, God. Um, too often people have been ready to postulate uh, supernatural explanations for something which later on was explained naturalistically. Now, I don't know whether there's going to be ever a naturalistic explanation of fine-tuning. Uh, there may be, but equally, the evidence might show it's even more fine-tuned than we currently see. Abstractly, that's equally likely. Um, so you're saying that the general idea of God that uh, so God Himself is too difficult to explain. So, hey. <coughs> well, I was approaching the question of the a particular reason for believing in God. There are other mm. considerations, yes. but any number <coughs> which uh, might or not be better. Um, but as I say, two problems. Um, I'm not convinced that fine-tuning uh, is a good reason to believe in any kind of designer and I'm quite sure that postulating any kind of designer still leaves the same explanatory problem. Mm. Um, like the business of God must be more complex than the universe, that's uh, Richard Dawkins' kind of classic um, argument. Um, but um, I don't think that that's a logical thing to say uh, because like, um, there's no fixed relationship between the designer and the thing they design. For instance, we build aeroplanes, but we can't fly. So uh, you wouldn't use the argument because we built aeroplanes, so therefore we must be more, better, better flyers than the aeroplane. Uh, and, uh, we uh, build computers that can actually do calculations a lot faster than we can. And we can imagine things that our, the idea in our heads is a lot less complex than, than the actual thing that exists. Mm. We, I think we have to simplify things a little bit to do that, though. We model things. But, we're, but if you use that, you're talking about people who um, don't have knowledge about everything. If you're talking about God, you're talking about someone who has absolute knowledge yeah. about everything. So he would have all of those ideas in his head. That makes an awful lot of them. <laughs> I mean, that's if you say the designer yeah. is all knowing. <coughs> but how all knowing? Have you been headache? No, like if, if it's a number of memories, if he, he has to acknowledge all these sort of things, if you took the thinking bits, mm. then he must have a lot of bits <laughs> of, of information. So. Uh, but if he thinks in a totally different way, which we can't conceive, then that might be simpler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that does strike me as so unsatisfactory. But if God is God, then obviously he would be greater than we could conceive. Sorry? If God is God, then naturally he would be greater than we could conceive, because we're less than God. Yeah. 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 It's still like the ontological level. It still doesn't answer the question, uh, who made God? Why is there such a thing? Mm -hmm. uh, um, thinking in terms of a designer in the abstract, any sort of designer, it can be finite or unlimited or it can be infinite. It can be part of the universe or above the universe. If it's finite, well, that's not an orthodox God. If it's infinite, it is, and then it has to be transcendent uh, also. And I think it's futile to make the design a part of the universe because that would instantly create the same explanation problem. Yeah, it's, um, it's got to be 
outside and, and prior to yes. yeah. the explanatory sense. That's why I said, you, did they get in the direction of God? You had to introduce these other arguments, like cosmological argument. Or Absolutely, or agree. Yeah. That, I guess, is not controversial. Mm -hmm. So, why do you. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I, I've, uh, the, what I've sort of looked into a little bit about this, and I'm sort of not a scientist or anything like that, uh, but it's, it's, I just wanted to know what you felt about it. You know that regression of cause and effect, and eventually you get to the first cause, which is God, because he had produced the second one. I, I understand that there's, uh, in science now, there's sort of, you can take a vacuum, which, which is, most people would say is nothing, but in actual fact, wherever you produce a vacuum, there's always a little bit of radiation in it, electromagnetic radiation. And you can't get rid of it. And it seems as though the space and energy, which is the radiation, are integral parts of each other. And where they come from, Lord knows. But within that, yeah. particles, yes. particles come into existence. Uh, at trillions of times a second, matter particles, and they have an antimatter particle associated with them all the time. When they come together, they go back to that energy. It's been likened to it being out in a desert of sand, and you say, well, there's nothing here, I'm going to make a hill. You build, you get your shovel out, and you build a hill, you also have got a hole mm -hmm. that you can't get away from. But overall, there's nothing. You can could, you could put the sand back in the hole. The matter particles and the antimatter particles, for, for, for all that we know, just pop into existence without a cause. That's at the subatomic level. The, uh, as I understand, there is cause and effect. They just, they just are. And I'm just wondering if somewhere in that thing is the possibility of breaking that, that need for some first cause and simply saying that our concept of cause and effect is it's just something in our brain, but that in actual physical universe, you get into that realm of the subatomic particles, antimatter, all that, that may be as, a, some, as space expanded, antimatter and matter particles separated, and so they couldn't annihilate them. And that's where, where we think. Uh, I'm too ignorant to comment on that sort of thing. I know some people have Ask said, a friend. <laughs> <laughs> some people have said that's, that uh, we don't need a God to explain existence because it could have come out of nothing mm -hmm. by these means. But I think that sense of nothing, that a vacuum, mm -hmm. isn't what the traditional concept of nothing, mm -hmm. really nothing, means. Yeah, but that's our brain. It's not that, that may not be a rea reality. That's mm -hmm. That's a redefinition of the word nothing. Yeah. I mean, it's something. You just described it. It has attributes, therefore it's something. Yeah. There was a lot of debate over the meaning of nothing. I mean, yeah, sure. Nothing. Mm. Mm. Sure. So, See, that's why it's called a vacuum rather than nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Tom? Um, so I, I actually think who designed the designer is a, is a great question. But, but going back to the infinite regress, um, uh, why do you stop at the physical? Um, what's objectionable in that infinite regress to going to something that actually uh, transcendent? To something transcendent, yeah. Um, what's not arbitrary in, in the choice of whether to stop at the universe has always existed or, or I, as a God who created it? Perhaps I shouldn't have used the term infinite regress. That implies it's a, there's something defective about the situation. And nothing, I think, at all objectionable in the idea of an, in, a, a, a universe that never came into existence at one time and always was, though the Big Bang theory suggests otherwise. Um, it is possible that there was never a time before which there was no universe. And in that sense, a regress. Why is it so? That's not explained. Or asking a different way, I asked the, the William Lane Craig question, which is uh, why, you know, why do we need to explain the explainer to accept the explanation? So, for instance, if I drop a ball, you, go, you say it goes down because of gravity. 
but do you actually have to explain gravity before you can use gravity as an explanation of why the ball goes down? Uh, oh no, uh, an explanation of a particular phenomenon can just consume the knowledge as it were. Our background knowledge, our knowledge of the law of gravity. But if the question then shifts, why is that so, then there will be another explanation. That, that's true, but doesn't gravity, the, the explanation of gravity, explain the phenomena of the ball hitting the ground? Right? You don't have to explain all about gravity to actually explain why the ball hits the ground. Um, we don't assume in the truth of the theory of the law of gravity. Yes. Um, but here we're saying, why not just stop at explaining fine tuning by postulating the designer um, in a situation where it's the existence of the designer is the thing in issue. We don't have a prior theory of gravity. But, but you which we can plug into our explanation. Right, but, but I'm, all I'm challenging, all I'm questioning is why do you need to go the extra step of explaining the explainer? Why is that a problem for the, for the, sorry, explaining the designer? Why is that a problem for the designer being the explanation of the universe? In the pragmatic sense, I'm happy to explain some phenomenon by pointing to some other phenomenon. If all I want to do is say, put up a bridge that stays up. So I go to my books and I <laughs> work out uh, my sums and I'm quite happy to leave to other people the validity of the theories that underpin all that. So I'm quite happy to leave the explanation at that point, let it, let it rest. But if we want to uh, use uh, no, um, I put some emphasis on the issue of how to determine the purpose of something mm -hmm. from um, observing its characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, yeah. Well, I, th I think that's an interesting point. Uh, and, um, uh, I would agree with you that you just looking at the universe on its own, which we call general revelation, and you ask, try to answer the question, what's the purpose of it all? That's a very hard question to answer, and maybe you can't do it. And so, like the Christian position is, you also need special revelation to actually tell you what's going on. That's right. Yeah. 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 And uh, like there's a verse in Ecclesiastes that says, God has set eternity into the heart of man but such that you cannot know the beginning from the end. In other words, there's all this in, uh, curiosity in us, looking at what's it all about. Um, we have a desire to know, but it's, uh, we can't know the beginning from the end just by looking at it. And if you've got independent uh, reasons, then that, that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. fine. I was just looking at where you go uh, from the observation of the fine tuning mm. and um, the emphasis is always sort of retrospective. It's fine tuned for life as if that was the only thing it could be fine tuned for. But of course all the things that exist well, you say can, pain well, and suffering. You can say there's there's complexity and with well I don't know whether you can um, whether there's an objective way of measuring that's a very interesting arrangement of, of all the things you've got. But um, that in itself is kind of points to a design with some sort of purpose, even if you don't know what the purpose is. Well, you could suggest that life is an acceptable byproduct of what it was really designed for. Well, that's, uh, that's like the analogy I gave of the, the gun. Um, the, the noise it makes and everything to do with its purpose. Oh, well, this for some guns, like starter pistols. So, Kevin, you used some big numbers at one stage. Would I be right in saying that your argument basically boils down to probability? Yeah. Yeah, they're just saying, like, um, with these numbers, yeah, like this, if you can't, you, a lot of these numbers are independent, so you have to multiply. But the Penrose number dominates everything anyway, so. Um, uh, that's about the probability. So the general argument is if you thought that this all arose from chance, 
then would you bet on those odds? Um, I would say no. Um, but the um, issue that John raises is like, how do you actually explain God? Well, uh, I, I have this been a problem for me too. <laughs> I've thought about that. Like, uh, how does God explain himself? Like, I, uh, uh, they, um, you say that God's a necessary being and has no beginning and end. But still, how, um, how does God explain himself? And, you know, it is baffling. Or do you think the same? Well, I, I can take existence and say that implies God must exist, go backwards that way. Mm. But if we take all the creation out of the picture, why does God exist? Why does anything, including God, exist? Yeah. And that's a big question. Mm. Yeah. Why is there something? Right. Well, nothing. <laughs> it's like that. Hmm. Hmm. Steve, you reckon? Oh, I hope this is not out of line, but I want to take up a point. I was out of line, I should have left. Yeah, well, I was going to say. It's all right, it's, it's working quite well. It's not a <laughs> true fine tuning argument, you know, but you raise the, um, the entropy issue as the most problematic. It's both entropy and, uh, as we observe in life forms, the uh, Continued uh, degradation, I guess, through um, the what do they call them? I'm trying to think of the right word. Uh, increasing entropy. In, in, increasing entropy in the physical world that, that seems to indicate that in, in life forms as well, the, the mutations that keep growing and growing and growing, yeah. and the, the gradual degradation that we actually observe a perfect design that is unwinding. That yes, I hear what you say. That you know, and I guess it relates back. To why did the design? Get it so wrong. I'm saying it was perfect, but it is actually, we've got evidence, physical evidence, that it is unwinding. Mutations coming in, entropy proving that any, any reaction we see ends up more loose energy than, than the actual uh, problem. So, to me, as a, as a Christian perspective, it fits perfectly with Genesis chapter 3. Mm -hmm. As an engineer, I, I don't think it does. <laughs> um, because entropy, sorry, I, I think I need to answer that one because yeah, there is a silence. Yes, yeah. Because uh, entropy is a concept that was developed around energy. Yes, yes, I've done energy. Energy. I've done that. Yeah. Initially, yeah. yeah. Therefore, um, all to me is it points to the fact that there's stored energy that's allowed to uh, this to occur. So that doesn't make it perfect or imperfect in my mind. It's just the mechanism by which the world functions. You need stored energy flowing to yes. lower energy states to do work or, or do some yes. or do something. That, that causes but there's no create. There's the, the net of the stored energy throughout the whole universe mm. is gradually depleting. Right? No, no, no. The energy's not depleting. It's just getting sorry. It's depleting. Yes, sorry. The, 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 the energy, useful energy, is useful energy. energy, 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 energy total stored energy. energy. Yeah. 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 So yeah. therefore, it, it doesn't seem to me that that's a sign of corruption or anything like that. It's just simply what it is. I think he was using those two separate things. There was just an example. Of no, no. It was, there was a, there was a, you were using the idea that entropy was a, a, a sign of corruption, and I, I, I don't okay, think that's well, the case. Okay. But anyway, that's, I'll make my point. But no, 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 I'm not at this time. No. Yeah, that because okay. um, it, it, the it, the universe is running down. Entropy is increasing. Mm -hmm. That's a, entropy is a level of uh, disorder. So the the amount of disorder. Um, is increasing, and so the long-term destiny of the universe is heated. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. So, but, but I uh, don't see that. We don't know the reason for that. That's all. What is Why is it so? Yeah, no. I mean, um, is there something after that we can't conceive what that well, means? Uh, yeah. Then, on the natural, as I say, on the natural, what mm. perhaps, the, or does it contract <coughs> or something? The, 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 the gradual mutation. Which I, I don't, and I guess I'm coming from a creation point of view, yeah. but I, it's a challenge we'd ever put to uh, anyone who believes in evolution. Can anyone ever point to a mutation that has actually created extra, uh, extra complexity that has been benefit? And I, I don't know that anyone should do it, which can point to one. In fact, there's a very famous video clip in which he asked the, the video clip to be halted because he couldn't provide the answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's not on the fine tuning over. No, it isn't. No, no, I'm <laughs> making the point. It's all right. <laughs> the, the, the reverse, well, I'm sorry, it, it was, it is. So when I say, the, the issue was, why did God, if it was a, per, you know, a perfect design, then why, why, you know, things not perfect? Yeah, if you take the biblical paradigm, then 
that does provide an explanation in uh, answering that why question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like one thing we would argue as Christians is, uh, if you take the Christian con uh, concept and kind of combine it with uh, uh, what you see in the universe, you can come up with a coherent position. Yes. Thank you. Whereas, uh, uh, I, to me, the atheist position is not coherent. Thank you. As it just sees the universe and uh, makes the best of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, we're here for no purpose and we have to make our lives, uh, all that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. for ourselves. I suppose that's where that idea, if uh, you were saying before about people, perhaps in the 19th century or something, we're all worried about the fact that the universe is coming to an end sometime, but today we don't really think about that because it's so far ahead. Mm -hmm. But possibly what they were thinking is no matter how far in the head, head it's going to be and how many people there are, if it comes to an end, then they will see that what they're doing now is without purpose. If it, if ultimately, it's nothing. Yes. Yeah. I think they were, and this is now moving in sort of moral mm. areas, mm. I think that's a mistake. We're all going to die. Western civilization will probably come to an end. Sooner rather later, but it's still lives of value have been lived and uh, things of beauty and whatnot have been created. It may all be wiped out uh, sometime in the future, but can't take away what it was <laughs> then. Well, well, no, it does take it away. It does take oh. it away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I was thinking, getting back to the six numbers. Um, I was thinking that uh, we, we see these six numbers have to be exactly spot on to produce wonderful things like our good selves, living things, and apparently intelligent and, and, and aware, aware of ourselves. And I'm thinking, that's all we know, that's our, our experience. But what if there is, sort of in number space or in, in, in the possibilities of what is possible, that there is other things, not just other things alive, but other states <coughs> that is not life as we know it, but is, would be absolutely remarkable states, whatever they might be. Mm. And there may be hundreds of trillions of those possibilities. Sounds like the multiverse. Yes. <laughs> it, it does, but I'm, I'm not coming it's to not, It's not the multiverse. But, but there's hundreds of trillions of possibilities of what could be. So and so it's not created for all those things. And we, and we just have to be one of them that's here. Yeah. It's like this there are lots of different searches and lots of numbers mm. because mm. they're only looking at a narrow definition of what is life. Mm. Mm. Oh, so mm. it, it's mm. possible people have speculated that life might exist which is not carbon based. Mm. Uh, well, there is a sulfur based life on it. Mm. Yes, there is. Mm. But I'm um, <coughs> not, uh, well, I'm not persuaded by people like Stenger who say a, a hugely different universe which uh, contains just radiation and hydrogen and helium could sustain any imaginable life. Just doesn't. Um, there might be something that, a state which is at least as remarkable as life, but it could yeah, it could be. Mm. Well, yeah, you, you, uh, yes, you made the point uh, during your, uh, uh, like, uh, God is untestable, uh, but um, are there other realities, like, are, there, are there other possible realities than the material world? Well, um, if you're a, uh, a dualist, you think that there are minds which are irreducible, yes. for right. instance, but if you mean other worlds, between which we cannot uh, communicate or detect, it's, it's, a, it's an abstract possibility, but it's yeah, all right. So, so, uh, yeah, yeah. futile. Yeah. I, I would say, like, um, um, we know the physical world. I would say it's obviously possible that there are other orders mm. of existence. Mm. Now, um, but they're not scientifically testable, so yes. it's not a scientific hypothesis, but science is not the only arbiter of truth. No. And uh, so it, it doesn't mean that it's untrue. No, so. if, unless you can define what the, what the characteristics are to some degree of precision, what is being asserted? 
Mm. So could, can you tell the difference between the estates existing and then not existing? Sorry? You, you say there are these other states of being. Yeah. How would you know what uh, they are or aren't? What, what would you see or think or feel or uh, observe would make? I know you can choose one way or the other. Yeah. Right, all right. Well, he said, all right, yeah. what's useful if you can't pin it down? That's what he's saying. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, with the arguments for the existence of God, like you have the ontological argument, you have the cosmological argument, the design argument, the moral argument, etc. And um, each of them may contribute um, a bit of the picture. That's possible. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, so it kind of does narrow it down a bit. Like if, if these arguments are any good. Mm. Um, so, like the cosmological argument would say, all right, there's a, a necessarily existing creator. The fine tuning argument might say that um, there's a designer. The moral argument might uh, contribute that um, uh, this is uh, necessary being a source of objective moral values. Um, ontological argument says there uh, must exist a necessary being, etc. So, uh, and the, cos the cosmological argument also say this being has to be treated transcendent, the physical world. So it does kind of build up a picture, and then you kind of have the biblical arguments and where it says that God has actually spoken in the world. So that's kind of how apologists will kind of uh, put all the jigsaw puzzle together. For sure. Mm. Um, uh, obviously, it uh, depends on each of them having independent. Um, Validity, or validity is too strong. If you rely on the notion of validity to deductive arguments, mm -hmm. I don't think they're all put up as deductive for sound. Fine tuning isn't a deductive argument, for Well, the formal one is um, the the, um, the, um, the formal argument that I've presented up there is a deductive argument yes, yes. in the sense that uh, if the premises are true, then the, yep. it's a valid yep. argument yep. and the clue. Uh, conclusion yep. must yep. hold. Yep. It's just a question yep. of whether the premises are true. That's right. Yeah, that's so right. valid, but well, you can true. argue whether it's sound. Yep. 